This is the science of stupid. Warning. The following program has been scientifically analyzed and found to contain significant traces of stupidity. Please do not attempt to copy any of the dangerous acts you're about to see. Yes, this is the show that extracts scientific wisdom from pure stupidity. Take notes as people with too much time and too little sense test the boundaries of science looking for fun. We'll reveal what went wrong and why with the help of such key principles as the coefficient of friction, animal defense mechanisms, and our old friend, Lit Force. Taunt science and your tempting fate. Watch out, it's the science of stupid. In this episode, we'll be taking control of terminal velocity. He was okay, looking closely at tire traction and diving headfirst into propeller science. But first, this. It's hard to imagine anything more terrifying than clinging desperately to a sheer rock face. Forty feet up, scrambling around for the slightest hint of friction. Pretty scary. But not scary enough for some climbers who like their rock faces to be mm, somewhat slippier. The Ice Climber, a rare breed that scales gravity-taunting ice-encrusted cliff faces and even frozen waterfalls. Yeah, just not for me. What makes ice climbing possible, aside from an inhuman head for heights and an enormous insurance premium, is the high strength of ice's unique internal structure. But it does have its weak points. Ice consists of water molecules arranged hexagonally to form crystalline structures. This tightly organized arrangement can make an icicle strong enough to support the weight of an ice climber. However, as ice grows, it can create networks of weak roots between the crystals. These are more perilous near the top of an icicle, which bears more of its weight and so is under more stress. Strike a weak point here, and that fracture can spread in an instant. Okay, before we grab our crampons, let's experiment with that unique structure. Here we have a man demonstrating how an ice shelf composed of zillions of tiny hexagons is strong enough to stand on. But not stamp on. Note how excessive force applied by stamping results in sudden fracture along weaker roots between ice crystals. Okay, let's ice climb. Close one. Still, the ice did hold strong there. Let's see how it does further up. Nah, not great. Although the icicle did kind of stay in one piece, it's just that it wasn't very well stuck to the grass at the top. You all right, Wallace? Okay, Wallace, but you do have to pick your icicles carefully. And that is not an icicle I would pick. Ice weighs nearly 60 pounds per cubic foot, so that icicle is already supporting over a ton of its own weight. Or at least it was. Remember, the higher you are, the more stressed the icicle, and the more likely you are to suffer a different kind of stress. And now we briefly avert our gazes from people doing stuff wrong and focus on someone doing something right, record-breaking right. Consider the skydiver in free fall, initially accelerating to Earth at a terrifying 32.2 feet per second per second. 
Imagine the relief when that parachute finally pops open. But what if they're not wearing a parachute? Like Yasuhiro Kubo here, going for a Guinness World Record title. He'll be free falling from around 10,000 feet and attempting to catch up with his parachute attached to this canister. The record is determined by how long he waits before jumping. At 50 seconds later, off he goes. Well, that was a relief and a world record. Free falling without a parachute is one of the most dangerous stunts imaginable. Do not even consider considering to consider to do it, ever. Especially when even regular skydivers have their off days. Uh, little help please, bro. Go on, you can do it. Go on. Great, thank you. All right, so how does a skydiver fall fast enough to catch up with a parachute thrown out nearly a minute beforehand? Well, to find out, we need to brush up on terminal velocity and air resistance. As an object falls, it collides with trillions of tiny air molecules, resulting in air resistance. As the object accelerates, the air resistance acting on it increases until it matches the force of the object's weight. It's now at terminal velocity, the maximum speed it can fall. A larger surface area increases air resistance and so decreases terminal velocity. A smaller surface area decreases air resistance and so increases terminal velocity. A skydiver in spread eagled position hits terminal velocity around 120 miles an hour after about 12 seconds. But for Yasuhiro to catch up with his chute, that is just too slow. So, which of our wannabe record breakers has remembered how we speed up our terminal velocity? Not these ones. That is the complete opposite. Their ramp has a large surface area, thereby increasing air resistance and slowing them down. OK, anyone else? Yeah, that's it. Going upside down and reducing his surface area decreases air resistance and increases terminal velocity. Trouble is, oh, whoa, it's very hard to control. Oh, that guy upside down too? Yes, he was. Once he's caught up with his chute, Yasuhiro needed to steer himself into position to grab it. How did he do that? Well, skydivers can also use air resistance to maneuver. For example, by adjusting his body shape, this guy deflects more air backwards, which pushes him forwards. Bullseye? Somehow all of our high flyers were fine, but I think we should leave the record to Yasuhiro. Now, can you guess what scientific principle this free runner is about to demonstrate? Did you work out the science he's about to show us? Yes, it's angular momentum. As he lands, he pushes back with his feet tipping the trash can. This rotates him around his center of mass, giving him angular momentum he probably didn't want. Who says recycling can't be fun? In 1956, race car mechanic Art Ingalls and partner Lou Borelli took an old lawnmower engine and fashioned the very first go-kart. They got about two horsepower out of it, but go-karts aren't all about straight line speed. Races can be won and lost on the curbs. Sometimes with a little help, 
but when you've crossed the line seconds ahead of the rest, it's a moment to treasure. Selfie? The secret to winning those corners lies in not losing too much speed or traction. And the secret to that lies in straight lining a curve. Our driver decelerates as he approaches the corner, sweeping in from wide and cutting across the apex of the curve before accelerating out wide again. This is called straight lining a curve. It maximizes the radius of the curve he follows, allowing him to maintain a higher speed with less risk of an understeer, where the front wheels lose traction, or an oversteer, where the back wheels lose traction. Okay, helmets on, and let's see who can straight line a curve. Well, he can. Beautifully sweeping in from wide, tickling the apex, and accelerating out wide again. Maximizing the radius and protecting the lead. Another one? Yeah, not quite as good. Approach the turn too tight and straight lining that curve is gonna be hard. So how about we take it a little wider? Eh, yeah, not that wide. An oversteer causes his back tires to lose traction. A little corrective steering later, and now it's a massive understeer. Two for one. Okay, we've got this. Find the line, maintain traction, and he's stolen the lead. Now, defending a corner means forcing your attacker to take the worst possible route. Yep, that was a bad one. As our driver cuts in, his attacker is squeezed out and oversteers significantly. So it's like I said, go-karts aren't all about straight line speed. The path to victory lies in mastering the tightest of turns. But we can agree, that is a little too tight. For thousands of years, the key to engineering strength has been down to a simple shape. This one. From the 4,000-year-old pyramids of Giza to Dad's bike. Well, the frame, anyway. The triangle has been recognized by engineers as the strongest of all polygons. Squares, rectangles, pentagons, nonagons, decagons. No shape is in better shape than the mighty triangle. Apply force to a square and you can change its angles, collapsing it even if its sides don't fail. This is true of all polygons, except the triangle. No matter how much force is applied, a triangle will not collapse as long as its sides don't fail. Systems of triangles, like trusses, are particularly effective at transferring loads to their supports and squares and rectangles can be reinforced simply by adding cross braces, which, yep, turn them into triangles. We owe the mighty triangle so much. Because of it, huge cranes can lift 1,100 ton weights. Factories, stadiums, and stations can bear vast roofs without supporting columns. And the legs of this child's swing set can easily hold the weight of these, uh, adults? unlike the rotten beam at the top. So how do you strengthen an entire structure? Well, trusses like these roof supports are a system of connected triangles that transfer the weight of the roof to the walls. This is either going to work or it's not. Now, I'm hopeful because there is yet another triangle, making your ladder very sturdy. See, the ladder's completely fine. Boy, that hurt. Now, rectangular structures, like a dresser, can be reinforced by inserting a cross brace to form triangles. This dresser. Yeah, that's just a rectangle. So the force of the impact has no trouble altering its angles. Still, it's much easier to pack up now 
Good work, guys. But remember, even a triangle is only as strong as its sides. So as a tornado tears through Russia, even a gantry crane that can support hundreds of tons in weight has its limits. The inventor of the first outboard motor, French electrical engineer Gustave Trouvet, was also responsible for the first electric vehicle, the portable electric safety lamp, the endoscope, and the light-up ballet dress. In short, the man was a genius. But thanks to the simplicity of Gustave's outboard motor, you don't have to be a genius to use one. The outboard motor, distinguishable from the inboard in that it sits outside the body of the boat, can be rigged to very small lightweight boats, giving them a high power to weight ratio. So, with all that power in your hands, wouldn't it be good to understand a little of the science? As propeller blades rotate, they accelerate a column of water backwards, producing a reaction force that thrusts the boat forward. The propeller can be moved left or right to steer. It can also be angled up, called trimming up, which raises the bow, reducing hydrodynamic drag when at speed for greater efficiency. Or angled down, called trimming down, which lowers the bow into the water, giving the hull more stability. Just watch out for your depth. Exactly how and when you alter the direction of thrust through trimming is a science in itself. Trimming up raises the bow, reducing drag for efficient planing. Or not. Yeah, or not. When in a boat with a high power to weight ratio, it's best not to slam the throttle on and off. Okay, on to steering. And where better to learn than dinghy derby practice, where boats can race upriver at over 50 miles an hour. And now, for a textbook 180. Ah, I've not read that textbook. One dramatic change of thrust direction, one massive increase of drag at the side, leading to two wet sailors. Reverse propeller direction to thrust backwards, nice. Trim up, keeping that prop clear of the bottom, loving your work, sir. And to finish, a little showboating. Classic. Drop your prop in extremely shallow water and your boat may stop. But you might not. But once you've perfected thrust and trim control, you can move on to more advanced skills. Like diving. The humble baseball, more complex than it looks, comprising of an outer layer of leather, several layers of yarn, two types of rubber, and a cushioned cork center. Its mass gives it lots of momentum. Okay, lots of momentum. Not always ideal, so a safer option might be this. Plastic, hollow, lightweight. It's kinder on your furniture and harmless fun for kids. But not for moms. All right, so plastic balls, not 100% pain-free. But with whole tournaments across the US dedicated to this variant of baseball, a few extra hours backyard batting for Junior could make a future star, provided they first complete their homework on velocity, momentum, angles, and vortices. Some plastic balls are perforated, and spinning them can allow air to rush into the holes, creating vortices inside that can curve the ball, making it harder to hit. Being hollow, the ball also has a lower mass than a regular baseball. So he needs to strike with a lot more velocity for it to gain sufficient momentum and fly far. And striking underneath the ball, so it launches at around 25 degrees, also helps maximize distance. 
Therefore, the ball's lower mass means they're safer for kids and beginners. And thanks to those internal vortices, curving the ball is child's play. You just have to know how to pitch it. This is not how to pitch it. I'm not going to try to hit you, though. I'm going to go to your <laughs> face. With that excessive amount of velocity and therefore momentum, they really didn't need to bother with a curveball because he didn't see that coming. That's it. Nice, fast swing, plenty of momentum. But for distance, you'd also want to aim a little higher. Yeah, a bit higher than that. You're looking for that 25 degree angle. It was closer to minus 25 degrees. Yeah, that's more like it. A high velocity swing and an angle closer to 25 degrees means even his hollow plastic ball is heading for the stands. Now let's see if we can launch it into next door. Oh, yeah, not quite. The achievements of science in this century alone are really quite amazing. We've detected water over 30 million miles away on Mars. We've grown functioning human organs and discovered that 68% of our universe is composed of a mysterious dark energy. But we're still not quite sure why people do this.